welcome everyone to today's lecture of the series Cultures of Images in the Digital Era, Practices, Aesthetics, Genres. I'm very sad. Uh, it's already the last one, I have to say. But all the more, I'm delighted to welcome my guest this evening, Daphne Dragona. Hi, Daphne. <laughs> welcome. Wonderful to have you here. Um, before I will introduce Daphne, I would like to ask you to leave your cameras and microphones um, switched off during the lecture. After Daphne's presentation, we will discuss with her. You can ask your questions by writing it in the chat or by just typing a plus and then ask in person. Please, uh, please feel free to um, post your questions in English or in German. I will then try to translate into English. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Daphne Draguna. Daphne is a curator and an author based in Berlin and Athens. She has curated and co-curated numerous cutting edge projects in many European countries and in South America. I would like to mention a few of them from the last years. In 2017, um, she curated an exhibition of the artist duo Christoph Wachter and Matthias Jud entitled An Archaeology of Silence in the Digital Age. I think it's that's a very important topic. It was on forms of exclusion and absence in online communication. And this project took place at the Axioma project space in Ljubljana, Slovenia. In 2019, Daphne curated a program for Akademie Schloss Solitude and ZKM Karlsruhe under the title Engineering Care. Um, there was a call um, for proposals and Daphne invited then artists, designers, technologists and activists for web residencies. I think that's a fantastic new format. Um, and she invited them to work um, yeah, to, to present works that capture how we will live and work with machines and how relationships and dependencies might change. Um, the most recent project I want to mention is Reprogramming Earth. I think that's also connected to tonight's topic that uh, ended only two weeks ago and was organized at Neme Art Center in uh, Limassol, Cyprus. It was a group exhibition that focused on technology's twofold character in relation to the environment, the exploitation of the earth on the one hand and the promise to have advanced technologies um, for solutions for the pressing pro problems on the other hand. Um, for many years, Daphne has been very active in the Transmediale in Berlin the renowned annual festival for media, art, and digital culture that you probably all know. She also has realized many projects with the National Museum of Contemporary Art, Athens, the EMST. These two institutions run like, like a threat through your work, um, I think. I also want to, to point out your work as an author and some publications that also correspond to the other projects and to the exhibitions, but at the same time form a very distinct um, body of work. One important topic is I think that of infrastructures that you keep returning to with different focus, for example, um, effect, datification and gamification. The question of how do we relate to one another in the digital age is at the center of your writing. Um, I want to mention two publications that resolve around the topic of gamification. There is an essay entitled Counter Gamification, Emerging Tactics and Practices Against the Rule of Numbers in the volume Rethinking Gamification from 2014. And then Daphne's PhD thesis completed in 2016 with the title The Game of Data, The Asymmetries of Power and the Possibilities of Resistance in the playful web. Um, Daphne also wrote in Transmediale publications on a regular basis. I only mentioned one essay called What is Left to Subvert? Artistic Methodologies for a Post-Digital World, published in the 2016 Transmediale Reader. 
two last very recent texts I want to refer to as um, Networks and Life Worlds, Ends and Endings, beautiful title, published in a volume by the Amsterdam Institute of Network Cultures in 2020, and an upcoming publication that is an article on uh, commoning the commons, revisiting the war of art in times of crisis that will be published in a Diaphanes volume this year. For more, I highly recommend to visit Daphne's website. I, I think it's brand new, right? Is the website? Yeah, <laughs> because I didn't see it when I um, first contacted you. So dear Daphne, I, um, I feel very honored you accepted my, my invitation. A very warm welcome again, and I'm looking forward to your presentation on Earth and Weather Images. Hello, thank you very much, Kirsten, for your uh, very uh, kind and beautiful uh, introduction. It's a really pleasure to join you. Uh, thank you all for attending. Unfortunately, I cannot see you uh, due to the circumstances. Uh, can you hear me okay? Is my connection okay before I start? How is it? All good? Okay, great. Then I will uh, go ahead and uh, share my presentation and we can start. Um, I wanted to briefly uh, say that um, I'm using uh, Ubuntu on my computer and for this reason uh, some things not, don't work so well, so you will have to bear with me in terms of sharing and unsharing my screen every now and then uh, for the material that I would like to share with you. Um, okay, so earth and weather images. Um, so earth and weather images are uh, mostly, we could say, aerial or satellite images taken by advanced uh, machinic apparatuses and infrastructures. And uh, such images are uh, produced to capture the world that we inhabit, to monitor and document uh, changes um, on uh, the world's uh, landscapes, atmospheres, surfaces, and to help predict climate sh shifts and developments. Earth um, and weather images um, may capture environmental catastrophes, but they also help uh, in processes of reforestation and environmental restoration. And for this reason, they provide um, indispensable um, information, not only to scientists, uh, but also, of course, to states uh, and to uh, citizens. Now, Whenever I um, have to think of uh, weather images and of images in general, because I have to say that I will uh, speak more uh, from, a point, uh, from the point of a curator and not of a specialist on photography. I'm not one, unfortunately. Uh, so whenever I think of this topic, um, always Willem Pluser comes to my mind uh, for his beautiful work. And um, I remember how he highlighted that um, uh, basically, images help humans to orientate uh, themselves in the world. Images uh, he highlighted are in a way mediations between uh, the world and humans. And um, they are meant to make, in a way, the world more comprehensible. Now, a problem that um, appeared in um, his opinion uh, with technical images, so the images made by um, photography, photographic machine by apparatuses, is that somehow they act as windows to the world. And for this reason, they make it difficult sometimes to question what one sees. And they turn reality into a global uh, image scenario somehow. Now, images um, of Earth operate in a way as um, big maps where one always tried to locate uh, one's position in them based on a country, a continent, a hemisphere. And I mean, the most familiar maybe example we have is um, uh, the case of uh, online mapping services, like for instance, Google Maps, Google Earth, where they contain at the same time, satellite imagery, aerial photography, street maps, panoramic views, and the user always um, becomes a data point and um, in a way tries always to zoom out in order to orientate oneself. So there is this kind of, um, uh, let's say, assumption or need that um, to orientate, navigate, 
uh, one uh, needs to have a point of reference, but one also needs to take a distance to be able to see from afar um, when taking a picture or when interacting in a way with the picture. And um, Eric's uh, most uh, famous pictures dated back in the 60s and the 70s uh, became famous for this specific reason, because they managed to capture the world, uh, the planet as a globe from afar, from space. And um, here they are, uh, many of you might know them. Uh, this is the Earthrise taken on December 24th, 1968 by Apollo 18 by astronaut Willem Anders. And uh, the famous blue marble uh, taken by the crew of uh, Apollo, 70, uh, Apollo 17 back in uh, 1972. Uh, now this, um, I should mention, are not the first pictures uh, of Earth. Other pictures taken by orbits and satellites preceded back in the 40s, 50s and 60s. But this became famous because there were images taken by humans, by astronauts. And um, interestingly, the, um, the picture that we see here, the blue marble, um, was not shot like that, but rather like that. This is the original, where the Earth is in a way upside down compared to how we usually see it. And uh, this was because um, uh, the astronaut that took the picture was weightless, would, could hardly see the continents, could hardly have a specific orientation towards the Earth. And uh, this picture was uh, taken also, so we can understand that later it was cropped and it was also kind of turned uh, upside down in order to have the image that we have today. Um, now, Blue Marble is a very interesting example because um, uh, at its time it became a um, symbol for um, environmental, for the environmental movement back in the 70s. And um, Beautiful Earth, hence the Blue Marble title, um, seen as a whole, let's say, and seen as a whole from, uh, uh, as a globe from a distance. Uh, was discussed uh, on one hand as a living system with its ecosystems and, uh, and its habitats, and on the other hand, it was also seen as a valuable resource, let's say. Um, this picture was uh, used by, in, for different purposes, and here we see an example from uh, the Whole Earth Catalog, a magazine that was discussing self-sufficiency in ecology back in uh, the 70s. Um, but what I point, what I would like to point out is how it also kind of um, uh, uh, pointed towards another direction. And this is something that um, uh, Jennifer Gabris, a scholar working in um, uh, environmental uh, media studies, um, highlights exactly saying that um, these pictures of the earth, the early pictures of the earth, simultaneously um, pointed at the rise of environmentalism as well as at the distancing um, of the planet through a disembodied space view for, uh, for humans. So um, inhabitants of the Earth could see, let's say, and realize that yes, they all share one world, one environment, and they need to take care of it. Um, but on the other hand, while seeing it from a distance, it somehow was becoming obvious um, that the planet was almost seen as um, an object, that an object that could be controlled, an object that could be programmed. This is the word also that Gabris is using. And the human was basically at its will, it was its master. Um, so the, um, this total image of Earth functions um, as also another scholar, DJ Demos, uh, Demos uh, highlights. Um, but this facilitated a universalizing discourse, implying that um, actually there was or there is no differentiated responsibility regarding what happens in the world. So it was like, uh, let's say, the, the impact that humans have on the planet would be the same for everybody, no matter uh, what um, kind of activity they, uh, they have, no matter how they live. Um, and this is another point to take in mind. Now, after um, the, um, after, let's say, the original Blue Marble, several other um, similar, in a way, similar photos followed, uh, released by NASA. And um, they were again total images uh, of the Earth, but 
what changed was that the images that followed were composite images of many satellite images stitched together. So this, for instance, is a release from uh, 2012, uh, which is created from that data collected during um, by the same uh, satellite, but during four orbits of it. And um, this is something that I, I kind of would like us to, let's say, keep in mind and uh, consider and think about what this idea of the total image of the air, um, Earth means. Um, because there is this image that I saw now and many other images that are kind of promising a totality of an area. Uh, this is a topic that very much um, Anna Peraika highlights in her book, The Age of Total Images. And um, she is specifically um, saying that uh, these are basically complex assemblages of machine and computational processes. And at this quote that I have here, we can read, she says that this totality is not homogeneous, it is assembled. The total image is composed of, um, oops, I'm sorry, I have to move a bit my, of many different parts, which are automatically or algorithmically combined into a whole across various angles, distances, and perspectives, each through their own respective interpretations and subjectivities. Um, so then, um, the image of the planet that we see um, today is this kind of composite image. And um, this is something that um, I would recommend if you want to also um, check out and uh, read about more in her book that I have here. But also I have um, a, another reference that I would like to bring in by Joanna Zielinska um, and um, her work on the non-human uh, photography, because it's important to also have in mind what kind of pictures we're talking about. So just like Peraika highlights that these are composite images made from many different images that are being assembled and even being corrected. Uh, Zielinska also talks about non-human photography highlighting that these are basic images that are not of the human, meaning that most of the times no human appear in them. And they are not made by humans, but rather by machines. And very often they are not addressed to humans, but rather addressed um, to machines. This doesn't mean that, uh, of course, uh, scientists and um, people working in different fields are not kind of uh, images, but uh, within the process of uh, taking and assembling and processing the image. Now I want to, uh, I would like to, to say here that um, while we can have in mind that let's say the original blue marble was uh, shot at the moment that let's say the environmental uh, movement was on its rise, when we discuss let's say the um, pictures of the blue marble taken in uh, the last uh, decade and until today, um, we have to consider what is the, the moment that we are in now. And, um, and things uh, have changed uh, in a way, not for the better, of course, because um, if back then the idea was more about also how to control the planet and its ecosystems, now the idea very much goes toward to how based on um, the mistakes that have been made, the damage that has been made, what can be done to, let's say, reprogram uh, the planet, to reset it, to reformat it, just like it is, uh, it is uh, an object that could be controlled. And uh, here I have um, two references that might be of interest, especially the work of Neirat exactly uh, discusses this, what it means uh, to reside off planet and um, to be detached in a way from Earth's ecosystems and to be thinking about solutions to, um, let's say, to, to reprogram it. And here practices that we're not going to discuss today, like for instance, the strategy of geoengineering uh, very much relate to. So this assembled image, the total image, um, might be seen in a way as um, uh, one more accomplishment of the mastery of um, the human over the monitoring, controlling, and optimization of the planet. 
Um, another uh, reference that, that I have before I move on is by Benjamin Bratton, the um, terraforming book, which um, you might know it's um, a reference that comes from mostly from sci-fi. It usually has to do with how planets, other planets might become uh, inhabitable. Um, but now the term is used in order to discuss how Earth itself can again uh, become inhabitable. Um, for the humans, thanks to the advance of uh, technology and science. So the question that I would like to bring in here is like, how um, do these assembled images of the world help us navigate in? And um, who is in control of this total view of the world? And how do these images help us understand the climate changes taking place at this very moment? Uh, in order to address these questions, I would like to to bring in uh, works by artists, projects by artists, and uh, to try and uh, discuss how um, they use images, how they appropriate images, and they are inviting us to reimagine our uh, relationship to the environment while also highlighting, let's say, um, the influence of the machine view and the influence of algorithmic um, regulation. Uh, my first, um, the first project that I would like to bring in is the um, project Geocinema by Asia Bajidereva and Michel de Jesus. And um, they started it together also with a collaborator, Alexei Olov. And um, this was a project which had the aim to examine how planetary scale sensory networks, such as satellites, surveillance cameras, geosensors, and cell phones, um, formulate the way that we see the world and its environmental um, changes. So for uh, the production of the work, the um, team conducted a long and really in-depth, um, let's say, research based on field trips, uh, specifically in Asia and uh, more specifically in China. Um, one uh, of the, um, let's say, examples, the cases that they really looked into was the case of uh, the Deep Bar program. Uh, this means the Digital Belt and Road program, which uh, is an initiative of China that follows the initiative on the Belt and Road. On Belt and Road, for those that uh, of you that might not know, this is an initiative that has to do with how. Um, Asia can be connected to um, Africa and also to Europe uh, in order to basically boost, to simulate, the, um, to simulate trade and uh, economic growth. Uh, so um, the DBAR initiative um, aimed to offer basically a digital nervous system of the globe, as uh, I read providing information about the events happening on the Earth, on the Earth's surface. And um, the name of the initiative actually uh, comes from um, uh, Vice President of uh, Bill Clinton back in the 90s of the States. Uh, his name was Al Gore. And um, he came up with this term digital Earth, wanting to refer to a multi-resolution three-dimensional virtual representation of the planet in which vast quantities of georeferenced data can be embedded. So this is what somehow uh, inspired the DBAR initiative, which started in China. And this is what um, the artists um, examined. And um, so they, for their project, they talked to, to different uh, people working there. They conducted interviews that we can see in the films. And they were specifically interested in the asymmetries that related to weather infrastructures. So specifically, for instance, they bring in like how um, the DBAR initiative uh, partnered with the UN Environment, Environment and Development Program in order to provide high frequency satellite data to support um, um, the Pacific, but also, for instance, also to support funding projects related to issues of air and water quality degradation in Africa. And somehow we, in the documentary, we see a lot that um, uh, there are, of course, countries that have this and support uh, infrastructures that can provide services to other countries that would have, let's say, to, uh, to, to be able to afford to pay a rent to them. Um, so the outcome is uh, a documentary, as I said now, which is based on imagery from different um, 
uh, from the infrastructures, from weather infrastructures, they are based on uh, the, its images that uh, its imagery that it's based on found footage, but of course also on uh, what the artists can on site. And uh, they very much, for instance, here is a scene of, of scene of how they use the also existing material uh, by users, they are also images taken by by drones. Now, what they uh, themselves interestingly highlight is that somehow um, the Earth's nervous system is not a totality and it cannot be. And uh, they say that it rather is one articulation speaking through a distinctly technological, ideological and um, geopolitical vantage. And uh, they highlight also how this idea of the Earth having one single image, this form of knowing on the Earth is ungraspable. Uh, let me show you uh, two minutes from uh, the film. So we'll stop sharing from here. And mm -hmm. here. Okay. The way we we living today, we we collect things data that definitely we are not going to explore. Give you a very specific example. I visited recently the, one of the places where they collect Landsat data in the U.S. since you in uh, South Dakota. I was able to witness the process. And we, we, of I was able to witness the, the process of the collection of the data from the satellite. Whatever they be collecting in every different round, whatever they be collecting in every different round. You have really is impressive because and you have really is impressive because the ground station just opens up. Then it just opens up. Then it moves the direction of satellites. The direction of satellites. And then, and then you collect it for some uh, and then you 15 minutes. For some, uh, 15 minutes and then they archive it. And then they archive and it. You can imagine. Mm -hmm. and you it's can imagine. An enormous it's amount of data. An enormous we have amount of data. data, we since, have 1970 data since 1970 something. So now we have a technology that allows us to have a satellite. We are able to do to the old earth, to the the old earth, from, the old earth from the outside. But that's a real revolution because it's, it's a, that's a radical disruption. Because, because you're not disruption. mapping something because from, you're not inside. Mapping something you're from, from the outside. outside. You're mapping from the outside. The Belt and Road is the just Belt and one, Road, just example, one example of, um, of um, spheres of influence. Which includes, which includes data, which is invisible, data, is which not is territorial, invisible, not includes other things. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence. Spheres of influence. They've been investing. They've been investing. Mm -hmm. All right, so I hope you got a sense of it. I wish I could play more, but time is uh, limited. Uh, the next project um, I would like to uh, bring is in is um, Asander by Tega Brain, Julian Oliver and uh, Dax Yolen. And um, this is a piece that comments on the possibilities and uh, limitations of um, environmental uh, um, management optimization today. So the um, artists of the project pay attention uh, in a way to how satellite imagery, and more specifically, they use the Landsat 8 uh, tiles imagery, uh, how this is used to capture and predict environmental changes. Um, now, the, um, this uh, I looked it up also, and this specific type of imagery is very important because it's um, captured by stations um, around the world. And it's a unique um, uh, resource because it has applications so in agriculture, in cartography, in geology, in forestry and regional planning. And it, um, it offers a time lapse of images. So it, uh, one can follow the development of the changes that have uh, happened in one specific landscape, in one specific territory. Uh, so Asander is basically a project that critically reflects upon the role that uh, artificial intelligence plays and uh, will play in the restoration of the environment. And of course, here we can imagine, we can, we can uh, remember 
sorry, that um, the vast amounts of big data, of climate big data, um, can be captured basically only by, by machines, by um, uh, artificial neural networks and not by human brains nowadays. But the question is how far can artificial intelligence go? This was like the, in a way, the question for the artwork. And um, what uh, would happen also if we would really trust it? What parameters would we give it also? Or how would we want to influence it? And um, Asander specifically looks into the potential of generative adversarial networks. I don't know if you discussed this in the framework of the series. These are the uh, networks that can generate images based on the um, data sets of um, they're fed with, in this case of satellite imagery. Uh, what the artist uh, did was uh, basically they built a fictional environmental manager that generates images from uh, for different parts of the world based on the data that um, they would, uh, let's say, offer, they would uh, give to the um, uh, machine. So this is a project with a speculative um, uh, character. And, uh, but it does bring in uh, examples of specific existing regions. And it runs on an actual uh, climate model that is able not only uh, to make forecasts, but also to propose specific, um, let's say, solutions or proposals or modifications. And um, what we see here is the actual installation, which is basically a three channel video installation connected to the computer that uh, also generates the images. Um, on the left side, the first uh, uh, projection has to do with the original images um, of regions as they're captured by satellites. In the middle section, we see specific data about this region uh, that uh, were taken in mind. And on the third uh, um, on the third screen, we can see uh, what the actual proposal uh, was from um, let's say from the neural network. Um, proposals now that's the interesting thing are purposely exaggerated and speculative, and uh, they are surprising. They are unexpected because we see cities uh, being relocated. We see uh, borders uh, changing. We see coastlines being flattened. We see areas being reforested, and one, one, when somebody experiences it, Sandra might wonder why. And um, the answer to this is that um, they want to kind of uh, basically explore what would happen if humans were no longer uh, uh, in the foreground. And this comes very much in accordance with Pega Brain's work that she's um, working on this notion of eccentric engineering. Um, specifically looking into processes of inclusion and exclusion in design and technology and uh, questioning what does success and failure mean when it comes um, to the environment and to the role of uh, technologies. Um, so this is a project basically about um, speculative fake uh, geography, synthetic landscapes as um, uh, also scholar uh, UC Parica and artist Abelardo Hilfournier calls it. And uh, this I think is a good um, opportunity to also go to the next um, project, which is a project by, by them. And um, because they are working together actually uh, for uh, the last couple of years on this topic, on the topic of images. Uh, in relation also to the environment. Uh, they are studying the role of uh, images, let's say, in Earth observation. And in this uh, quote that I have here, they specifically uh, summarize why images are important. And they say that geographical knowledge starts with how we see, or even more accurately, with the production of images through which we see, observe, analyze, and identify. Images are the supportive instrument for understanding territory formations and their mediating role is crucial in establishing the scene that defines geographical entities of knowledge. In their work, which is called Seed Image Ground, and it was kind of uh, released uh, last summer, they study uh, aerial photography specifically. And uh, they also refer to how it's associated, how, excuse me, it associates to military aerial operations. 
a topic that um, I believe um, was also tackled in the um, lecture of um, Michael Richardson a while ago. The question that they phrase, which is um, um, very interesting, is what happens when Earth becomes the target? And in order to explore that, they bring in one specific example that has to do with the practice of seed bombing, um, which is basically an old technique used in uh, forestry, agriculture, and environmental uh, restoration, which um, uh, basically means that uh, containers filled with seeds uh, and soil nutrients are, are um, kind of um, uh, are being brought to the soil. In the past, uh, they were. Uh, this was done uh, in a simple way by basically burying these seeds. Now, uh, in our times, what happens is that very often drones and aircrafts are dropping these uh, seeds to areas that uh, either have been uh, either um, are facing an issue of um, um, of um, deforestation because of let's say fires or because there is an issue with uh, soil degradation for other reasons. So they are kind of taking this as a point as an example to discuss, let's say, the role of images. And um, some of the issues that are of interest for them is, and I know again that um, uh, Michael Richardson referred to that, they, for instance, uh, discuss how images are, uh, machinic images specifically, are operational, so they don't represent anymore. So here we can see one image on the left like that, but they rather are part of processes uh, that, um, that they can detect, they can identify, they can visualize, they can control. So this makes them operational, a uh, term um, opted by uh, Harun Faroki that uh, coined it. And, um, and they're also interesting in the notion of, uh, let's say how the notion of, um, uh, ground um, truth is changing and um, because this is um, this is a notion that uh, usually refers to um, uh, direct observation on the ground but uh, nowadays it more has to do with uh, ground truth which depends on uh, on, uh, on the a truth captured on the surface of the image on a truth uh, captured on um, data sets of images. And they kind of highlight how we uh, unavoidably need to pay attention to how images become the object of knowledge, to how earth data and data sets become the object of knowledge and how we have to learn and navigate through them. Uh, I will uh, now again um, share and share my screen in order to show you a short excerpt from their work. Mm -hmm. The scenes we have combined, juxtaposed and rearranged, show the air, the ground, seeds and images. They show the air from the ground, the ground from the air, the plants as images, and images as they define the ground. The circulation of how we know and how we picture, how images grow and how our growth is imaged. Most of what we see deals with pace and speed, how to, how to hasten the transformation of living surfaces. Surfaces are managed vertically as part of, surfaces a, longer of, vertically as part of a longer history of the motorized descent. First as war, then as reforesting. First as war, first then as, as images, reforesting, then as bombing. First as images, first as aerial bombing. photography, then first as automated drone surveys then as automated drone surveys. It feels like surfaces are lifted off the ground. It feels like surfaces are lifted off the ground. We shift between the lab and the landscape. We shift between the lab it happens and the in the lab. It's repeated. It happens in the landscape. It's repeated. Those are remade into laboratories too. Those are remade into laboratories Plants fabricate too. landscapes. Plants they take shape, landscapes. change color, they take redefine shape, areas of soil color, level, redefine areas sensing. of soil level, and in remote sensing.
Yeah, so as you saw, their uh, work is basically a two-channel uh, video, a video essay actually, which is um, which juxtap juxtaposes uh, different images, images produced by machines with images produced by humans, images produced in a lab. Uh, with images produced at the landscape. And they also kind of bring to the foreground the, um, the drones, the infrastructures that produce these images. The um, last project that I would like to refer to is uh, the Open uh, Weather Project by Sophia Dyer and uh, Shasha Engelman. This is um, a project we started uh, last year, aiming to explore the relation of bodies to contemporary weather images and weather infrastructures. And as a parenthesis here, I would like to question, quickly mention that, of course, the, the body is um, how we sense the weather. The body is affected by the weather and um, the body reacts to the changes of the weather. Um, and weather forecasts to a great extent are meant to protect bodies, and uh, to keep bodies, um, let's say, safe and secure. So Open Weather is a project that approaches uh, the body as a situated technology. We seem to refer to the different weathers that different uh, bodies around the world are experiencing. And um, they wish to bring in the politics of uh, location and the different um, social, economic, historical, geographical and political positions that are experienced um, around the world. The Excuse me, the starting um, questions behind this project for the artists were who or what gains power from satellite imagery, radio technology and meteorological data? And what happens, what would happen if um, people uh, gain access to this imagery through their own kind of active involvement? So this is a, a project that has a participatory and performative elements. Um, it uh, explores how whether transmission basically can be embodied. Um, the artists um, invite uh, participants in workshops to um, use inexpensive antennas, to use available radio software, to use uh, to build the DIY ground stations where they can receive um, the transmission of um, satellites. They specifically um, work with the uh, images from the active National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. Um, that they, uh, with, their, with their DIY approach, they manage to receive, to decode, and interpret. And here, for instance, we see an image from a performance that uh, the two of them gave back uh, in May when during the lockdown, where they were in different areas uh, at the same city. And they kind of, um, with this antenna, they reached out and while having it connected to their computer, they downloaded um, the images. Um, the methodology that they approach is a feminist methodology, uh, taking in mind uh, writers like Adrian Ritz, Audrey Lord, uh, Gloria Anzaltua, Rosie Braidotti, specifically to examine how bodies are situated within relationships of power. And uh, their work, as I said, has elements of um, performative and participatory elements. So they are often, uh, they're based, it is based on workshops, but they also have um, a how to online guide where you can also read how to build your own kind of ground station. There is also an online handbook where they kind of document and write about um, the process of their work. And um, they also have a very interesting online archive with users around uh, the where they can document this process of let's say um, uh, receiving uh, this uh, signal from the satellite. Um, interestingly, this is a, a project that uh, one could um, refer to it as a project of social meteorology. Uh, this is a term that I adopt from Janina Randerson who that's um, who wrote the book weather as a medium and she says that um, this is important because this is a meteorology from below it is a meteorology that builds associations between social life natural life and economic life and um, as they say themselves uh, whether by using our bodies to write noise into a NOAA satellite image or collectively creating a patchy image of the earth we subvert the view from nowhere 
and counter Google Earth's forever um, noon on a cloudless day. And uh, this is like an image from the landing page of the website that is very beautiful because it's made from different pictures that the users have um, received and they are fragmented. You no longer have um, a total image of the world here. Um, so to, to close, what conclusions can be drawn about our possible navigation um, and in the world and understanding of the world today through images? Um, the artists, uh, as we saw, use satellites and drone images, appropriating them and integrating them in their work in order to exactly discuss the possibilities and limitations of their utilization by governments, countries and companies. Um, they refer to images uh, made um, by machining apparatuses, but they also incorporate them in their work and they use them critically and speculatively. Uh, they juxtapose them with um, images um, made by photographers. They complement them with footage uh, that it might be found or made by themselves. And, and interestingly, what has happened is that these Masonic images find a new role in the hands of the artists because appropriating um, non-human vision with a critical angle, um, the artists uh, invite users to unsee themselves from the role of the master to let go of the role of the godlike positioning and um, which might be everywhere and nowhere. And here I adopt a bit what uh, Zielinska underlines as what non-human photography can offer. Um, and a common element that uh, I also think is of uh, great importance is how they aim to reveal and expose the machinic infrastructures. So we kind of saw like how this gigantic um, weather infrastructures in geo cinema, the smart uh, drone infrastructure um, uh, offered for seed bombing, um, the potential of small DIY infrastructures, different kinds, different scales, different examples. So to the assembled image of the world that I mentioned in the beginning, the artist counter proposed new edges, new edits, excuse me, and stitches of their own that purposely allow different perspectives, angles, points of view, and points of view of the world. And um, here we can think of how the geocinema documentary is itself an assemblage of very heterogeneous material, of how Asander appropriates data sets and generates images, of how seed image um, ground, uh, presents uh, side to side images from the lab and from the drone. And ultimately, this unstitched uh, image here of uh, the open weather, which is a great example. So to enhance our possibility to navigate in a planet suffering um, a climate crisis, multiple perspectives need to be acknowledged, need to be welcomed. The detached total view of the world hides away views which depend on different experiences, different geographies, different histories of bodies in these spaces. And this goes for the human world, but also for the more than the human world that suffers the consequences of the climate crisis. So let's hope that um, one can be in the position to seek, to find, to study, to explore multiple perspectives and to try to navigate within those, because such viewpoints might assist in restoring relationships relationships to the environment, relationships to territories, to populations, to ecosystems that are being lost. And then the restoration of the environment that so much we like to talk about will also come in a different way though. So a total image of the world can only be assembled artificially and can only be alienating. So maybe let there be images, machinic and human made by many apparatuses and by users that will be always accessible and endlessly navigable, navigable. Let's hope maybe for that. Thank you very much. <laughs>